Okay. Last time we were dealing with uh, some application of the residue theorems theorem, and now <coughs> I want to enter in the details that I left for the this case, right? For the integration of a rational uh, rational function over the reals times x alpha minus 1, where alpha is smaller than 1, alpha not alpha real, okay. This is the interesting case. In general, you can take alpha to be real but not an integer, but then you reduce to a polynomial something times something which is like this, okay. So the assumption we, are, we made is that this tends to 0 as z tends to 0 and z tends to infinity. And uh, if you remember, I just made a slit in the plane because 0 is a branch point. Remember that in order to define this power, we have to introduce the logarithm, and the logarithm is not defined in zero, but it means it's not defined in a neighborhood of a zero. And we considered as a region G, the region which has the contour as follows. We have two circles centered at the origin one of radius r, I say CR1, CR2, I don't want to use capital R for the ray because R, capital R is also the rational function, okay. And then I also consider these two segments parallel to the real axis and I use this orientation, right. Okay, so what I, I'm trying to do is to apply the residue theorem for this case, for this class of functions, all right, and with this choice of contour. So the region G is this, so I will consider then the residues inside the region G and the boundary of the region G is CR1 where, where CR1 is this part of the circles of radius R1 plus L2 plus C sorry CR2 CR1 minus L1 okay plus L1 sorry the orientation is this okay so this is the contour. And if I show that the contribution on the circles is vanishing as R1 tends to 0 and R2 tends to infinity, and if I show that these two contributions on the segments, which will become the off line 0 infinity, are in fact the ones you are considering, you can calculate this integral using the um, using the residue theorem, right? So let us start by considering this situation. Take mod of z equal to rho, and consider this function here, which extends to the plane this, which is defined only on the real axis. Hmm? So z is some rho times e i theta and theta varies okay in general. What I can do is the following substituting after substituting the z with this I have that d z is i rho um, e i theta d theta. 
and therefore the integral this is plus no this is rho is general what I want to do to show you is that okay g is a region g CR1 plus L1. It is pion or plus? Okay, okay. Ah, okay, thank you. So, your question uh, uh, is about this symbol here, right? Yes. So, if I say union, I mean a union of sets. When I say sum, I already use this symbol sum for curves. It means that I consider the function with the juxtaposition of, of uh, curves, okay? And this plus or minus means that I preserve or invert the orientation. So as I said, the boundary of G is in fact this set union the other sets. But as a function, I use this notation because I can just consider one curve, so reparameterize the, say, the, the, the segment from 0 to 1, for instance, and stop at T1, then consider the other, which begins from here, where the other ends, continues up to here, then, and so on and so forth. So this plus is, 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 in, is in general adopted as a symbol when you consider in, say, in topology, Okay, the curve which is obtained by just the positions of curves. Okay, and the symbol plus, you can also take actually a combination of curves, putting some coefficients, normally integers, which means that you consider, for instance, the same curve count several as many times with the orientation or with the reverse orientation, okay, according that the sign is positive or negative. So, if I un uh, understood the question now, I adopt this notation, which is the one where we also use some in some previous example, probably. Well, I used this last time where when I when I consider the Laurent series. Remember? Okay, let us come back. We consider neighborhood of a singularity. Yes, and we consider two circles inside the analogs. Remember this? We consider this and this. So these are two circles. And then I consider also a segment connecting the two circles. And then I consider as a curve C, C1 uh, plus lambda minus C2 minus lambda, right? I use this notation. Check it. Check on, on your nodes. But what I meant was the following, you say, move this way, go this way, then move this way, and then come back. And this becomes a closed curve. So the symbol I used here is exactly like the ones I'm using here, okay? So what I'm doing in this calculation is to show that in order to calculate, you know, so when I calculate the integral over the boundary of G, the contribution along this portion of circles is the zero, when the radius tends to zero and the small radius tends to zero and the other tends to infinity, okay? Okay. And so let us continue here. With this substitution, this becomes the integral between 0 and 2 pi of what? Of i times rho e i theta square rho e i theta. And then I have something rho e i theta, right? 
no not square sorry alpha minus 1 sorry alpha minus 1 be theta which means that well notice that this is rho a theta and this is rho a theta alpha minus 1 correct. So, I have that the integral is in fact the integral between 0 and 2 pi of rho e i theta to the power alpha r rho e i theta d theta and this from our assumption tends to 0 as z tends to 0 or infinity which means as rho tends to 0 or infinity and this applies either for r1 or for r2. Okay? Good. Now, so the integral over the boundary of G is in fact is the integral over C R 1 of the same amount but these two integrals are infinitesimal as rho tends to infinity or as rho tends to 0. Okay? And then I have the two integrals over L1 and L2. Well, L1 and L2 are the two segments, different opposite orientation parallel to the real axis at a certain distance, positive distance from the real axis. So, they are symmetric, but with inverse orientation. Okay. So, we are moving like this, then like this, like this, and then like this. Okay. Now, what is the problem now? It's how to write z alpha minus 1 in the two segments. The problem. So, now we have to be careful about the notation. Remember that z alpha minus 1 is a definition the exponential of log z and this is the complex logarithm times alpha minus 1. So, that this becomes Write exp of alpha minus 1 log, this is the real logarithm, and here when I write this way, I mean that I made a choice of the argument, all right. And if this is true in L1, Using the same notation in L2, we have that z alpha minus 1 becomes x of alpha minus 1 logarithm. And this is the same, you see, because the distance from the origin is the same of points on L1 and on L2. Hmm? So it is independent of the fact that they, that they are symmetric. But theta becomes. 2 pi is mi minus theta, right, on L2. So, L1 is here, this is the real axis, this is L2, this is L1, and this is L2. So, if this is the angle theta, sorry, theta, this is the angle 2 pi minus theta, to in order to use the same, the same principal argument. Of the in the cho in the definition of the function log. Okay. Okay. So, 
when I have to calculate, so I this put just put so therefore. When I calculate the integral the integrals over the two segments, I have well in fact this is the integral. I write the z as x plus i delta. Delta is the distance from the previous picture I could put this, this delta ok. This is the distance from the origin. So, z is x plus or minus i delta, delta is constant right and x varies. So, we are integrating over the reals essentially and the, the two um, extremal values of the, the, the of the integration for the integration is r r r 1 and r 2 precisely the center the, center, the radius of the small disk small circle and the, of the big circle right remember that these two l 1 l 2 where this is a zoom of the previous picture right where in g Okay. The two segments cutting parallel lines, the annulus, okay, center at the origin of radius R1 and R2. So X is moving between R1 and R2, here and here. Therefore, the integrals reduces to the integral over the real sometimes, because delta is fixed. And I have so using this notation I have that this can be written as uh, z alpha minus 1 r z d x say ok and plus this is the integral of what? Well remember that as I said well probably I said but I did not write it explicitly. So, z alpha minus 1 I write it here again z alpha minus 1 is exp of alpha minus 1 times log mod z plus i theta in L1. And this is exp of alpha minus 1 log mod z plus i 2 pi minus theta in L2. Therefore, we have that this is okay, like the other one with a minus here, but then I have a, a coefficient 2 pi i alpha minus 1 which come out. So, we have the same amount with the minus in front but I have also I have x of so one, 2 pi i times sorry yes times x ok. You see this 2 pi minus alpha and I have to multiply this entire value of the lo complex logarithm times alpha minus 1 ok. So, there is an extra term 2 pi i alpha minus 1 as part of the exponent. So, here I have then the integral this is the integral over this is L 1 say, this is L 2 ok. 
And here I have 1 minus e 2 pi i alpha minus 1 of the same z alpha minus 1 r z d x. And I inverted r2 to r1 because I'm move, I'm integrating over l over l2, huh? or probably vice versa, right? This is r2, r1, or vice versa. I don't remember, say the orientation. Okay, but I have to revert because in one case I'm moving from the right to the left, and the other from the left to the right. So when R1 tends to 0, so probably this says yes. OK. When R1 tends to 0, uh, no, what I had here is something different. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is R2 integral e 2 pi i. This is what I finally have, the integral in between R1 and R2, sorry. 2 pi i alpha z alpha minus 1 r z d x, where this is the integral over L2. Now, changing the sign and putting together, I have this coefficient coming out, which does not depend on x and on z in general. This is constant. In other words, when I then consider the case that r1 tends to 0 and r2 tends to infinity, on the right hand side I have what I'm looking for times a constant. So the integral between 0 and plus infinity of this integrand function times this number, which is independent. And on the left hand side I have the sum of the residues times 2 pi i included in the uh, plane with the slit from 0 to infinity. Because the contribution on the portions of circles uh, are vanishing when r1 tends to 0 and r2 tends to infinity. So to conclude, this is an, as an application of the theorem I I have that the integral 0 plus infinity time 1 minus c 2 pi i alpha is 2 pi i sum of the residue of the function f j alpha j in g. And g is the general situation, G, G is in fact so this is the application. So not simply the sum of the residues, but it has to be divided by this constant which comes out from the calculation. So the two contributions do not cancel each other, but give you something which appears here. So let us probably see in, a, in one of the examples I, I, show, I, I wanted to consider. This is the one we consider, right? 1 plus x, the x. So in this case, r of z is 1 over 1 plus z. And uh, well, and so we have that z to the alpha times rz. And alpha is in between 0 and 1, right? So this is, in fact, infinitesimal as z tends to 0 and as z tends to infinite, OK? Because, well, this is a rational function. The order is 1. The denominator is degree 1. Numerator is degree 0. When you multiply this rational function times this z to the power alpha, alpha is positive. So you have a numerator which, va which is infinitesimal as z tends to 0. The denominator tends to 1, so no problem. But then when z tends to infinity, the 
uh, degree of z is 1, which is greater than the degree of the numerator, which is alpha, so that it goes faster to infinity. So the denominator goes faster to infinity, and so that r the, the, the ratio tends to 0. So we have the, the hypothesis satisfied to apply the theorem. And there is only one residue for r of z, and the so one, sorry, one pole, pole is minus 1 for r. So it's not on the real ax on the positive relaxing, which is good because we're integrating between zero to n. and so it's quite easy. To this sum reduces to one summand, and what is the residue of the function f at minus one? The residue is minus 1 to the power alpha minus 1. Why? Well, the function f of z we are considering is z to the power alpha minus 1 over 1 plus z, which is a pole in 0, in minus 1, sorry. So that if I consider the limit as it tends to minus 1 of 1 plus z times f of z, in this case I have to write 1 plus z, Mm -hmm. And then this is what? Minus 1 to alpha minus 1, the power alpha minus 1, right? So that this number here is to be calculated. Is it normally a real number? No, it is not. Mm -hmm. We are calculating some, uh, not in some, some root of a negative number. So in general, this can be odd in the reals. Huh? But in the complex number, we can do this because, well, we can write minus 1 as the logarithm, sorry, as the exponential of the logarithm of minus 1, right? And this is the exponential of logarithm of modulus of 1, which is 0, right? And what is the argument of minus 1? Pi right? Plus i pi. This is the principal argument. Huh? So minus 1 is in fact x e i pi. So this number here is e i pi alpha minus 1. Correct? Or this is e i pi alpha times e i pi with a minus in front. What is this number? Minus 1 again. So this is minus e i pi alpha. So this is the residue. So if we apply the previous general consideration to this particular case, we can say that the integral we are dealing with is 2 pi i times the residue of f at minus 1 over 1 minus e 2 pi i alpha Correct. Correct. But in this case, this is 2 pi i, the residue is minus e pi alpha, and then I have 1 minus e 2 pi i alpha. Then I notice that this expression can be somehow simplified. In the following way, I write e pi i alpha to be u. Therefore, the integral which was 2 pi i minus u over 1 minus u squared 
right with this substitution now becomes minus 2 pi i u over u u minus 1 minus u this is not never zero right for any choice of alpha e 2 pi alpha is never zero and here I recognize up to the sign and so I can I, I change again I have 2 i over u minus u minus 1 times pi and this is the reciprocal of what of sine of alpha because remember that u is this this is 2 i so I write this way e pi alpha minus alpha pi so I have that this is pi over sin pi alpha complex sign so this is the final expression okay in our calculation which is which can be which can appear to be difficult but it's much easier than to try to use standard integration properties from the real okay this is an proper integral which is normally not very uh, affordable huh? okay as I promise I don't want to 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 make you become a, such uh, so, so to, to annoy you with the, the integrals um, and let me continue by saying something else that is to say let me add some comments on closed curves. So again, I will use the, the notation and I explain like once again why I use plus, minus, and, and so on instead of using, okay? So in fact, you can consider the curves uh, and to put some algebra structures on curves, on the set of curves, mm -hmm. which is quite natural, and to make chains of curves, of curves, right? Then you apply, for instance, homology and uh, homotopy techniques using this notation. Okay, I will not go into the details. However, let me say that this is quite standard to, to, to think of. To put a, a coefficient in front means to consider this curve reparameterized and counted with positive or negative uh, orientation according to the sign of the coefficient you put in front. And the sign is always an integer. The sign, sorry, the coefficient is always an integer, right? So, let me just um, give you an, a geometric application of uh, what we have known about the, the complex integ line integration. So, you probably all know, but I guess none of you have seen a, a complete proof that uh, close injective curve, continuous injective curve, that is a Jordan curve, Okay, so no self-intersection are allowed, and the curve is closed and continuous. This, that, that's uh, essential, continuous and not self-intersecting. Then in the complement, it has two components. One is bounded, and the other is unbounded. This is the famous Jordan theorem, which states, okay, for the circuit, it's easy to see. Right? So any deformation of the circle, in some sense, this is topological stuff, okay? Any deformation of the circle, but without overlapping okay imagine that you have an, a band an elastic band and you move it okay so you can make different shapes but in a sense from a topological point of view you are always dealing with the circle until you over overlap the bands then okay and th this changes a lot in topology you are dealing with the circle. So it is quite natural to so, say, well, it's obvious. In the circle, you have something which is bound, and the other component is, so not in the circle. In, in, yeah, in the complement of a circle, you have something bound. In the but it's not very easy to prove in general. <laughs> this is a famous Jordan theorem about Jordan curves. However, what we can do now, we have enough, say, instruments to say that the, 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 in the complement of a Jordan curve, curve, we have at least two components, which is 
a weak reformulation of the theorem. Okay? And in order to prove this, we apply the, um, the fact that we know something about the index of a point. Okay? So let me just remind you the basic notation for Jordan curve. So Jordan curve, Jordan close, sorry, Jordan close curve is a continuous closed, of course, curve. In fact, you can define also a Jordan path mm -hmm. and then consider a closed path to be Jordan if it is a uh, it is a closed curve, which is also Jordan. So, Jordan means, uh, which is injective. And to be more precise, I have the curve gamma to be defined in A, B into C, the plane curve, plane curve. And then I have the gamma of A is gamma of B, so it is not injective in A, B. In in the open subset A, B, okay? And gamma of T is different from gamma of S for any T different from S. And T and S are in A, B. So it's not injective in A, B because gamma of A is gamma of B, right? Because it has to be closed. But no other points are allowed to have the same value in the segment, okay? Which is quite natural to consider. So you can have, well, different pictures. This is one example. This is another example. Okay. Now assume that we start from when we start from <coughs> uh, so this is lemma one, say. We start from a Jordan curve, closed Jordan curve, not passing through the origin. Okay. And we also assume that there exists Z1 and Z2 gamma such that uh, well this is zero this is our gamma All right um, Call it this is the two and this is the one. Such that, okay, I have that the two points, Z1 and Z2, divide the curve gamma into two sub, uh, into two arcs. Call it gamma 1 and gamma 2. Okay. With these properties, gamma 1. It's not intersecting the negative real axis, and gamma 2 is not intersecting the positive real axis. Okay, such that call this part of gamma from Z1 to Z2, okay, according to re an orientation is uh, implicit with the definition of the uh, Jordan curve gamma. So consider this path, gamma 1, and the other, gamma 2. And assume that gamma 1 has no intersection with the negative real axis, and gamma 2 has no intersection with the positive real axis. This can be always done, because since the 0 is not contained, you can always move, okay, this curve, or if you want the frame, 
in such a way you put the origin in the middle and separating the two arcs, the two paths, gamma 1 and gamma 2. OK? So just a matter of how to. Then, if this is, oops, <laughs> if this is the case, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I have the index of the origin with respect to gamma is 1. Okay? And I show you how. Then first, I indicate by L1 this segment. So L1 is the, this is the statement, okay, lemma. This is kind of proof. So call L1 the segment from Z1 to the origin. Of course, it is oriented. I, I choose this direction. And L2 is the segment from Z2 to the origin. Right? Then the origin stays away from the curve. The curve is continuous, so that I can consider a small circle center such that it doesn't intersect the curve gamma, okay? Now, but it intersects, for obvious reasons, this segment, segment L1 in C1, and the segment L2 in C2. So C L J is C J. That's obvious because the segment L J connects a point outside. Okay, but in any, in any case, it connects the origin with something else, which stays away. Okay. Now I restrict my consideration on this is the C, but then I put well C one and C two, the two portions of circles which are with endpoints C1 and C2, so respectively. This is C1 and this is C2, okay? I use this notation. And the part of the segment in L2 from Z2 to C2, I call it delta 2, and is from Z1 to C1, delta 1. All right? Just names. OK. C is C1 plus C2. OK? So if you want to see C to be a curve, then I prefer this notation. If you want to see it as a subset of C, I use the other, OK? You, OK? Good. So then I define, so keeping in mind this picture, I cannot re, re, write everything on one, <laughs> on one slide, but keeping in mind this picture, <coughs> so define sigma 1 and sigma 2, two paths. The two paths are the following. So I show you first what I'm doing. I'm just considering this and this, okay? So if you, follow my, if you follow the orientation we have given to the curves, so this is a positive orientation, okay? Then if I use this orientation, I have gamma 1, then delta 2, then minus C1, minus delta 1 to define sigma 1 for instance, okay? 
So gamma 1 plus delta 2 minus C1 minus delta 1. And similarly, I define sigma 2 as, well, I have gamma 2, then delta 1, minus C2, and minus delta 1, okay? And I have, I said, gamma 2 plus delta 1 minus C2 plus delta 2. So, <clears throat> and this probably also gives you an explanation why we prefer this notation instead of union, okay? Because when I have, well, I notice that sigma 1 plus sigma 2 is what? Is gamma 1, you can, it's gamma 1 plus gamma 2, which is gamma, sorry, minus C1 minus C2, this is minus C, right? Probably I, I I put it wrong. It is minus delta two, right? But let us check. Okay, gamma two delta one minus C two minus delta one minus delta two. Sorry. Okay. So the contribution of the integral of the sorry of the of the segments cancel each other. Okay. So we. Okay. Now I have that. This number here is what? And gamma zero minus and gamma c. <coughs> Correct? But I can also say that and gamma zero is and C one zero plus N C two zero plus N C zero. Now you understand why we prefer this sum and and minus in front of a curve, okay? Because well, this is a, a close. This is the sum of two closed curves. Sigma one is a closed curve. Sigma two is an Closed curve, right? And we calculate this. The, remember that the, the index was linear huh? using this this um, definition of sums of curves, right? Closed curves. So on the left hand side, I have this, and then this, and this on the right hand side, which means that if I calculate the integral over gamma. So what I said is wrong here. <laughs> uh, sigma 1 plus sigma 2, right? Correct? This is what I have. On the other hand, this means precisely this. Because the of the additive property of the integral over the curve. If you have a sum of two curves, and you have the integrals summed, so it's essentially okay. The two curves are the contours you are in, uh, where you are integrating, and they are two, two split curves, right? But what can we say about this value here? This is zero, and this is zero. No, sorry, this is one, and this is zero as well. Why can we say so? Well, first, sigma 1 has 0 by construction, and the unbounded huh, it stays away, OK? From, it is 0 in, in the unbounded component. And similar for sigma 2, the index is 0 because it is in the unbounded component complement 
in a multi component of the complement, right? In a multi component of the complement, sorry. Whereas for the circle, the index is 1. Good. So, with this in mind, let us go to, to the second part, which is the interesting part. And this time we consider this is Jordan lemma, but say weak version. Which states the following the complement of a closed Jordan curve has, and then this is the weak version, at least to. Connected components. So we start from a closed <coughs> Jordan curve, and with some hypothesis about the frame we are referring it to. So such that gamma as a set is contained in this half plane. I write it this way because I probably use it some other time later. H plus is the set of complex number whose real part is positive. So the right half plane and when I use this with the plus on the top of H, I mean the set of Z and C such that M Z is positive. So this is another half plane, just a rotated half plane. Okay. So I also assume, and this is not, uh, this is without losing any generality. So the curve is there, so which means that in case I'm, I move the frame on the left, right, and I can also shift vertically the frame in such a way that there are two points on the curve, one in the upper half plane, H plus, and the other in the lower hmm, half plane. So, and such that there exist Z1 and gamma and Z2 in gamma with M Z1 negative M Z2 positive. Okay? So the situation is the following. So for instance, if I had a curve like the, the other one, had to move the frame this way. Okay, and this is always possible. So you simply shift everything in order to have a picture which at the end of this Yeah, okay, I'm assuming that the entire, okay, let, let, me, let me make you a picture. So these are the assumptions. Uh, let me make a picture here. So we are essentially considering a curve which is closed and in this right uh, half plane, H plus with the plus, uh, which, which, whose plus means real part positive. But that the curve could be also in the this first quadrant, for instance. So what I'm assuming is that well, no, this is not the case I'm interested in, and I want a curve like this. So there are points here. This is the one, and this is the two, for instance. Okay. This can be done because, as I said, you can shift the frame as you want. Okay? Good. Now, well, let us start from this, okay? So, here is the origin. 
So the origin is not is in, in the unbounded component of the complement of okay. What I can do is well I can join these two points. Sorry, this this D one is here, right? And Z two is here, Z one is here. And what I have is that these two segments eventually intersect the 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 curves into other points here in uh, two points and here also in two points. Okay, so I can always restrict my consideration to what to two points Z one and Z two in the respectively in the lower half plane and in the upper half plane. We call lower half plane the the uh, the half plane of of the Gauss plane whose uh, elements have imaginary part negative, so lower. Upper means imaginary part positive. Then you say right half plane, the plane where the curve is, that is the plane, the half plane where uh, the, uh, whose elements have real part positive, and then the left half plane, okay, so up, low, right, and left. This is just by convention, okay? But what I'm saying is that you can always assume that in fact the Z1 and Z2 can be chosen and uh, this curve in such a way that they are these two points, the Z1 and Z2, okay, in this picture. What I mean is that the entire segment 0L and Zj connecting 0 to Zj does not intersect any point of gamma. Okay. Right. So we are, say, in a situation like this. So we can assume. So I put this this way. We can assume that uh, the segments O Z J J are such that Lj and gamma has no intersection. Okay? This is not restricted at all. Now, so let us go to an enlarged picture like they have here. Okay, this this and then I put maybe this is another example. So I put Z1 here and Z2 here. Okay? Just to be um, to have a larger picture because I have to add some uh, extra extra rays and so on, okay? <laughs> I could continue on the other, but it would, it would be too difficult to then to see the differences. Okay, so this is what I denoted by L two, and this is what I denoted by L one. Okay, good. And I consider the segment, sorry, the segment, the portion of the curve from Z one to to Z two to be called. Uh, let me see, gamma 2, and from Z2 to Z1, gamma 1. So these two points are distinct, and they are the endpoints of two paths, Jordan path, gamma 2 and gamma 1. Let's assume that we have also the this orientation and that we choose this orientation for the segments as I said connecting the origin to the port point Zj so this way. So gamma is gamma 1 plus gamma 2 once again. What I mean is move and continue okay this plus means the following and I define this time sigma 1 to be what? I have L1 this, this, okay, L1 and then uh, 
minus gamma 1 minus tau 2 and I have sigma 2 to be L 1 plus gamma 2 minus L 2. These are two closed um, curves. All right. So, sigma 2 minus sigma 1 is gamma in this case, but in general it can be plus or minus. Uh, if I have the difference of the this, this two closed curve, I have plus or minus gamma. Okay? So, I have in this case with this notation, I have this other possibility because I have chosen a, a in any case the difference of these two closed curves is plus or minus gamma. Hmm? Good. So now uh, let me uh, let me make some observations which depends deeply on the fact that we are dealing with continuous functions. So these two points have um, imaginary part Z1 and Z2 which are one is positive and the other is negative. The imaginary part of a continuous function, uh, if you think that this is function from an interval into C, sorry, this is gamma, right? Uh, this is a continuous function. So, it can be viewed as a, uh, as a pair of functions which are continuous. And in the complex planes, the, the, the pair correspond respectively. The, the first element is the real part and the second is the imaginary part, right? So, if you say that gamma t is x t y t, then this is also this x t plus i y t, that is z of t. Uh, since this is positive and this is negative and y is continuous, then necessarily it is a zero. So that I can say that gamma one intersects the real axis. And similarly, gamma two intersects the real axis. As you can see here, gamma two in this in this picture, this is just an example, okay, intersects in more than one. In fact, this is the, this is a consequence of the, the, the statement, okay, any continuous function in an inter, this is a real, real valid continuous function in an interval and assume that on the endpoints the, the values are, uh, are such that their product is negative, okay, so one is positive, the other is negative, right? This is only possible. Then there is at least one zero. This is the existence of a zero. But nothing is said about where it is and how many there are, right? In fact, in this case, there are more than one. Here there is only one. Okay? For this path, we have one zero, but for here, for this path, we have, for this function, we have more than one. Okay? Actually, to apply the the, the, the zero theorem, the existence of, the, uh, of a zero for a continuous time, you have to see it as the, the projection, okay, or just to see it on the imaginary axis. However, what I'm saying is that, well, define x2 to be uh, 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 um, an element, uh, to be the element in gamma 2 intersected with, that, with, with maximal distance from the origin. So, I choose this. Okay. What can I say? Now, with this picture in mind, 
I continue and I say, well, what about the index of x2 with respect to sigma 1? Okay, let us go this way. X2 is defined as the element in gamma 2 such that it is a real number, so the imaginary part is 0. Maximal distance from, from the origin. Sigma 1 is this Klaus curve. So I can definitely say, since the curve gamma is Jordan, so it is injective, so it cannot have self intersection, so the x toe is in the unbounded component of the complement of sigma 1. It cannot be in here, because otherwise you, the curve would have self intersections. So I can actually say that this number is 0. Remember that we have proved that for any point in the unbounded comp in the com in the unbounded component of the complement of the curve, the index is zero. Correct. So what I, I say now is the following. This is thirteen, right? In particular, this implies that n sigma one of z is zero for any z n gamma two. Because remember that we have proved that this is true for any element in the in the, in the component. So it's a property of the component of the point. So no? the index is constant on the component, right? And since gamma two is a continuous path, any point stays in the same component; cannot be in different components. No? All right. Now, using the same picture and the previous lemma, if x is here, and so very close to the origin on the real axis, positive real axis, but very close to the origin, we have that the curve sigma 1 and sigma 2 are surrounding okay the region where x lies okay it can be considered as the zero of the previous lemma so if x is very close to the origin the origin is one of the points of the curve sigma 1 or and sigma 2 but x plays the role of a point okay of the point of origin in the previous lemma and therefore we can say that if x is a real number such that modulus of x is small than epsilon for a suitable choice, then this is true for lemma 1. right now we are very close to the end so let us go back to this picture so co consider as we did here x1 to be the first of the intersections of gamma 1 with the real axis the first in the sense that we have a segment a b to consider so if x1 has parameter t1 associated to it, so the other points which lie in gamma 1 intersect to r are such that their parameter associated is greater than t1, okay? So it can be only later if you give the role of time to the parameter t that gamma 1 of t intersects the real axis. So I consider this point x1 
in this picture there is only one, so the, there is no, no extra choice. But so in general, take x1 to be so let x1 be the first uh, in terms of the parameter point of uh, gamma 1 intersected with r, which is not empty. Huh? Remember, this is not empty, so there is at least one. If there are many, choose the one with parameter associated, the smaller. Okay. It's not necessarily the, the closest to the origin, but this, for instance, in this case, assume that there is, this is the closest, but it's not the first. The first is here, okay? <laughs> if you use this parameterization, this is the first, this is the second, third. But this is the closest, not the first in the sense that the, the first from the left. The first according to the parameter chosen, okay? Good. Now, What can we say about this number here? The index of this point x1 with respect to sigma 2. Let's go back to this. This is sigma 2, and this is the point x1. Okay, it plays the role of the origin as before, okay, in the previous lemma, and this number is 1. Okay, good. But this means then n sigma 2 of x is 1 for n is z and gamma 1. As observed before, any points on gamma 1 lie in the same, each point lies in the same, in the same uh, connected component of the complement, right, so that the index is the same. Now, between x1 and x2, these two points are separated, the curve is Jordan, all right? So there is at least one x naught. Actually, there is an interval, okay? This is the first, this is the last, but I can say more. You can find minimal distance between the two points in gamma 1 and gamma 2. This is an interval. Uh, this defines an interval on the real axis. And any point in this interval have this property. There exists an interval of the real axis such that call it i, okay? Such that if x is in i, so the interval is clear at this one. This interval is with one endpoint and gamma one and the other and gamma two that such that if x is in I we have that uh, index of this x with respect to the curve gamma is 1, okay? Putting together the previous result. 
So the origin is outside, so the index is 0. And for at least one x different from 0, the index is 1. So there are at least two components. That's what we can say. Okay. As you can see, it's not easy to <laughs> even to prove this minimal. So not, not easy. So it's not very direct, the very direct proof. It's an application of using terms. Okay. Now, this ends the part of consideration about integrals and application of the integrals. Let me go for a while, just an introduction to what we will be the next topic. This is up to my choice, of course. Huh? So we have seen that there are several topological restriction to, to have sets to be homeomorphic, right? The mug, the torus, the donut, one of the exercises in topology. So similarly, there is no hope to have a homeomorphism, which extends to something which becomes holomorphic, between the analogs and the disk. Okay? Assume that we are looking for a function f, which is holomorphic in the analogs. Such and uh, with inverse, G defined on a disk. There is no hope for topological reasons. Okay? If it because any holomorphic function is, in fact, continuous. It would, it would, then we would have a, a continuous function with events continuous from a non-simply connected domain into a simply connected domain. We also know that there is no possibility to have, in general, a holomorphic, led, um, yes, we cannot have a holomorphic function with inverse between any pair of simply connected domains. And Liouville theorems, in fact, is an obstacle to this. Take the plane, which is simply connected. Take the disk, which is a simply connected domain of radius, whatever you like. Any function which is holomorphic in the complex plane it takes its values and the disk, so it is bounded and entire, then as necessary it is constant. So there is no possibility to have a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So the next uh, topic is about, well, def about the definition and so the description of possible sets which are, in fact, by holomorphic, which, which means that there exists a function from one set to the other, holomorphic, with inverse, which is also holomorphic. Liouville theorem is somehow spe a special result because we can prove that in some cases even unbounded simply connected domains and bounded simply connected domains can be biholomorphic. And one classical example is the unit disk and the upper half plane hmm? or the right half plane which is just the rotation of the other. So we will investigate in general what happens for biholomorphic functions and sets which are biholomorphic, sets which are biholomorphic. So we'll give this definition, definition, two sets, omega 1 and omega 2 and C are said to be biholomorphic or sometimes you can find biholomorphically holomorphically equivalent 
f, there exists f from omega 1 to omega 2 holomorphic with inverse g holomorphic. Okay, so of course there are some as I said topological restriction for two sets to be holomorphic to be by holomorphic and such a function f or g f is said to be by holomorphism and of course also g okay. In particular we may wonder whether there is some easy example. We start from two sets. This is the general definition. But what if I restrict my consideration to one set and I say, well, I want to consider one set and see if there is a function from this set into itself, which is one to one. Do we have examples of biomorphism of that find on that time of that kind? Well, of course, the identity is a good example. The identity is why well, the exponential is not? Not any. <laughs> not any. Depends on the set. So. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Sure. 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 No, no. I'm saying. Well, I'm restricted to a, an open set, for instance. And I consider which, if I, I wonder if I can find. I'm able to find uh, a function from this set into itself, which is holomorphic with an inverse. I'm not saying that the entire plane, okay? Well, just to be on the safe side, let us say that there is at least one example, the identity, which is always useful to, to remember, okay, to know. I don't know. We have examples, okay? But then, as uh, your colleague said, of course, if you take a linear, Transform a linear function, which is a function like this. This is an example. Of course, A and B are complex numbers, and A is not zero, right? This is an example of a biholomorphism. of C. Okay. Of course, in this class there is also the identity when A, A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 0. Exponential is not even <laughs> injected, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> this time, no. Depends, okay, you can restrict, and have, but in general it's not. Okay, good. So, may I ask you, uh, j since you you um, you um, came uh, you 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 brought our attention to this linear function, this is linear. This well linear. It's not linear technically. It's not linear. It's an affine function. But anyway, this is co normally called a linear function, okay? Because it reminds the line, okay? Uh, in the real case. Anyway. Is this just an example of biomorphism of C or the example? So let me tell you that, well, as a notation, if uh, omega 1 and omega 2 are sets of C, we can indicate by all omega 1, omega 2, the sets of functions from omega 1 and 2 omega 2, which are holomorphic. This is the notation, okay? And, and by holomorphic, I don't know if it, this is the notation used. It's f from omega 1 and 2 omega 2, f by holomorphism. Holomorphism, but I am sure that if you restrict to the case w 
which omega 2 and omega 1 coincide, then you normally use automorphism as the notation, okay? It's just terminology stuff, nothing more, okay? Use this notation, automorphism. So my question is now, is the class of the automorphism, is the set of automorphism uh, for the domain C completely described by this, so by these two para this, this uh, linear functions? So, just to leave you with some, the answer is yes. But <laughs> uh, I don't remember what's the number of this 16, probably 16, 17. Let me just point out that we, we can say, well, th we, have, we are dealing with an entire function, so no poles can exist, right? So take F holomorphic. And C. So, and tie, right? Half cannot have poles and C. No other singularities, okay? Not even poles. Right? Question What about the point at infinity? So assume that F is injective, and we are dealing with automorphisms of functions which are invertible, so they are for sure injective. And take D any bounded open set in C. For instance, a circle. Sorry, a disk, not a circle. Disk. Huh? But this is D. And then consider the closure of D and its complement in C, which is open. Why? Because its complement is closed, well, okay? So what I'm doing here is the well, this is D and this is C minus the closure of D, which incidentally is unbounded. What I can say is the following. Since F is injective, F of D cannot intersect the image of the complement of the closure of D. Are you with me? These two sets are separated and distinct, disjoint. So the image cannot have intersection, which means that this set here, okay, is not dense. In why? Because this is open. Because remember, F is holomorphic. D is open, an open set, and F is open. So F of D is an open set which means there is an interior, okay? It can be whatever you like, but it has an interior. So there are points with some interior. And this is the image of what? Of a neighborhood, as I already uh, observed. It's a neighborhood of infinity. This is the embodiment point. And it is any neighborhood of infinity, because I cho I've chosen D to be any general open set but bounded, which means that if, if you go very close to the origin or very far from the origin, you take an open neighborhood of the, not the origin, sorry, of the, of the, the infinity, its image, 
according to F, is not dense. So it cannot be an essential singularity. It can only be eventually a pole at infinity. But so just to, okay, I, I, I'm, I run out of my time, but just to leave you some ideas, okay? So it can be a pole at most. It cannot be, it cannot be a removable singularity because otherwise we would have a holomorphic function over a compact set. This would be constant, so and it's not invertible. So in any case, so the only possibility is it's a pole. But if it were a pole of order, say, m, and m is greater than 1, then infinity would have m inverse images. Right? Condense at, at, at infinity. And then the function would, wouldn't be 1 to 1. So the only possibility is that this pole at infinity is of order 1. Which means that, in fact, if you write down the Laurent series, okay, it reduces it to a polynomial. Okay? But the polynomial of degree at most 1 because it has to have, it has to be injective. Otherwise, if, you, if the degree is greater than 1, then necessarily there would be several inverse images of 0. So the examples you gave us is precisely the set of all automorphisms of the plane linear functions. Okay? So I invite you to think about the fact that automorphisms of a set first include the identity, form a group uh, with respect to composition of functions. Okay? And we'll continue on uh, Friday. Thank you for your attention.